good evening everyone so in this evening session we have uh, two talks the first talk uh, will be delivered by professor juan garcia belido of ift madrid and uh, he'll be talking about the present status of the primordial black holes so uh, we will have questions at the end of the talk so if you have any questions please uh, drop your uh, questions in the chat box i'll be taking these questions and uh, we can also open the uh, you can also at the end of the talk you can also open your unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions directly so over to you professor garcia belido thank you very much well thanks to the organizer for this uh, invitation to a wonderful workshop i'm enjoying myself so i'd like to present to you a, a scenario a scenario that have been developing over the last say 24 25 years yeah? which started with my similar work with Andre Linde. And the idea is that quantum fluctuations in the early universe, particularly during inflation, would produce primordial black holes almost inevitably. And why do I say inevitably? Because most analysis that have been done up to date only consider the quantum fluctuations themselves and how that affects the power spectrum. But actually we know that there is also quantum diffusion. And quantum diffusion produces very important non-perturbative non-Gaussian tails. You cannot expand with an FNL parameter to describe the non-Gaussianities of those fluctuations. And therefore, this high tail will produce inevitably primordial black holes on very small scales. Of course, on top of this, we know that the thermal history after the universe reheated after inflation produces a radiation pressure which prevents collapse, except in those places where there are special times in the thermal history where there's less a uh, matter, uh, relativistic matter, and this produces an enhancement of the probability of collapse. I will claim that it is possible to make a connection between the generation of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes and that of matter, that is baryons, at the same time, at the QCD transition, and also explain why the fraction of dark matter is about five times that of baryons. This scenario predicts that there's a multimodal mass distribution of black holes, not just a single mass, it's not monochromatic, it's multimodal, it has several different masses from 10 to the minus five solar masses to 10 to the five solar masses, and each one of those ranges are extremely interesting because they could help to solve some of the different quantum graph that we are encountered in cosmology. Among other things, the uh, non-Gaussian uh, feature of the, uh, of the spectrum of fluctuations pre predicts that there should be cluster primordial black holes. Those black holes are no longer not just distributed in mass, but they're also uh, heavily clustered in objects that are 10 to the four, 10 to the five solar masses composed of more heavier black holes right at the center and a, a swarm of uh, black holes orbiting around. So all of these actually helps resolve essentially all of the monochromatic bounds that we have been listening in, in the different talks uh, along this workshop. Moreover, those black holes would be the seeds for logical structures. So it would be the seeds for intermediate mass black holes as well as supermassive black holes. They will resolve the small scale crisis of uh, the lambda quadrat matter model, the ultra faint dwarf galaxies that we see in the Milky Way and other galaxies, the core cost problem, etc. It has extremely rich phenomenology, wealth of observational signatures. I will not have time to go through the whole array of uh, um, signatures that are already uh, there to tell us about the primordial black holes at dark matter. I will concentrate on two, actual, two very important probes. First, the gravitational lensing probes, that is strong peak and micro lensing which we've heard a beautiful introduction just a, a while ago. Then also the gravitational wave probe, which will allow us to measure the mass, the spin, merger rate, the clustering properties, et cetera. But which has also been measured by uh, Jassim and, and uh, Vivian, we have the possibility in the future with uh, Pixie possibly to look for the CMB spectral distortions and also connect with the primordial uh, population of those black holes before recombination, before structures started to form. Now, within the galactic structures, we can look for rotation curves. This could be explained with primordial black holes. We could look for the massive black holes and, and the relation to uh, the mass of the halo that they inhabit. We can look for uh, specific properties of the hypervelocity stars in Gaia and how they could have come from slingshot effects in, in dwarf galaxies, etc. But most importantly, there's a very bright future for this field because soon we will have third generation gravitational wave observatories like the Einstein telescope and LISA and third generation also large construction surveys, uh, both photometric and spectroscopic like LSST, as well as a CMB uh, experiments like Pixie. So we are in a tremendously exciting era. We'll be able to connect many different scales and many different uh, 
epochs in, of the universe. And this is very appropriate here because we know from inflation that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between epoch, number of epochs before the end of inflation, and the scale that that corresponds today and how it, what it corresponded at the time when it re-entered the horizon. So if you can follow my cursor, you see that there will be scales that were deep inside the horizon during inflation that leave the horizon and remain essentially unperturbed until they re-enter the horizon in the radiation and matter era. Now, given most of the fluctuation that we observe in the CMB and logical structure correspond to 50 to 60 EFOs before the end of inflation, scales on the contrary, which would correspond to a, a smaller scales so like the electroweak scale, the QCD, and all the way to Big Bang nuclear synthesis would have left the horizon, say 30 to 20 EFOs before the end of inflation. And it is these scales which may have features that uh, I will describe and give rise to the primordial black holes. Now I will, uh, in general, there are several of course, uh, models of inflation that actually uh, generate uh, large fluctuations and on small scales. Uh, we were some of the first to, to uh, propose uh, single field models of inflation, but I will concentrate in particular on the Chris critical Higgs inflation developed with uh, Sterrit Morales and uh, Jose Maria Chiara. And here, the only quotient that you have to add to the standard model, and I want to insist on this, we don't need a physics beyond the standard model. Just take into account a non-minimal coupling of the Higgs to gravity. And once you consider the running of the self-coupling, the quartic self-coupling of the Higgs as a function of scale, so if we both go back to the early universe, higher densities, then we see that the action corresponding to that Higgs can be described with a lambda phi fourth term and a non-minimal coupling to gravity, which itself produces a potential that has this shape, very simple shape. This means that we can connect on large scales, the CMB and isotropies, and on very small scales, the fluctuation that gave rise to a primordial black holes, which will be clustered. Now, one of the basic predictions of these kind of scenarios with a little bump in the potential is that it produces a jump in the power spectrum. And this jump can be very abrupt, k to the four or larger. So it's important that all the CMB and logical structure constraints have to do with very large scales, 10 to the minus four, inverse megaparsecs, all the way to 10 to the 2 inverse megaparsecs, or 1 or so. And definitely, those scales are much, much larger than anything that will be generating primordial black holes. So if we look for primordial black holes of masses of order 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the few solar masses, then we're looking at this range. Now, this is the primordial power spectrum, but that's not the whole picture. And it's important that it is not because what determines the probability of collapse to form black holes is not just the uh, width of the Gaussian fluctuation power spectrum, the two-point correlation function. It's actually the full distribution, the full tail. Because what matters is the following. This is In this uh, transparency, you see that as a function of scale, as we go to smaller scales, we have the CMB, this gives the very stringent constraints, but as we go to smaller, smaller scales, those constraints become weakened. And in particular, if we have a, a large enhancement in the power spectrum or in the uh, fluctuation amplitude, then what matters in order to determine whether a black hole collapses or not is the gradients of curvature. Gradients of curvature create forces, and this, this force is larger than radiation pressure. There's nothing that can prevent collapse. And there is a connection between the mass of the black hole, which is essentially the mass of the horizon, all of the mass in the horizon forms the black hole, and the number of free falls from the end of inflation that that fluctuation left the horizon. So for 30 solar masses, we're talking about about 36 in the number of free falls. So very tiny scales. Now, it's very important what I mentioned about the statistics of the distribution, because what determines the probability of collapse is the integral from some critical value to infinity. So if you have very high tails, here is a, a comparison between the Gaussian or non-Gaussian tail of a, the generic uh, fluctuation spectrum from inflation, then you could have Gaussian statistics, so exponentially suppressed uh, amplitude, and therefore very rare uh, uh, domains actually collapse to form black holes, or on the contrary, chi squared are even larger, even power law uh, dependences on the fluctuation spectrum, which would make it much more probable for the tails uh, to collapse to form black holes. Now, this requires an extra step in complication of the analysis because you have to do the uh, stochastic delta n formalism. That is, you have to take into account quantum diffusion a la Fokker Planck. Okay, and here's the formalism. You start with a curvature fluctuation as a function of uh, time and position. You make the expansion on a given hypersurface, 
of the uh, fluctuation in the number of efforts from the end of inflation. And there is an average value and an actual number of efforts from the end of inflation that depends on each position in space. Now, this, the probability of the uh, fluctuation being above a certain magnitude for a given scale depends on a Fokker Planck equation that takes into account that diffusion. And one can do this analytically for certain simple models, in particular for the uh, inflection point models that uh, we proposed in, in 2017 with a very tiny slope, because we can write the uh, solution to the focal Planck equation in terms of the uh, characteristic function of this uh, focal Planck equation. And we can resolve for that characteristic function in terms of the pose of the distribution. So we have the residues of the distribution, which gives you the amplitude, and the pose will give you the exponential tails. Now, in a specific model, we can work out what is the shape of that power spectrum, or sorry, not power spectrum, the full distribution as a function of the curvature fluctuation, okay, theta, which is our n here. So you notice that if you would only look at the peak, you could assign a Gaussian distribution around the peak. However, the exponential tails are very non-Gaussian and very non-Gaussian in a non-perturbative way. We cannot do ex uh, perturbative expansions around the Gaussian by introducing a small FNL parameter because that does not capture the full non-Gaussianities of the distribution. And this is going to be crucial in order to determine, uh, resolve most of the constraints and determine the actual probability of collapse and the number of black holes that we have there. So, Apart from this probability, there is the fact that once you have a very highly non-Gaussian distribution, it's not true that the fluctuations, the probability of where do you find a black hole is just simply Poisson distributed. No, because you have many black holes of very different masses simultaneously coexisting with a highly non-Gaussian fluctuation underground. And therefore, what you typically find is that the correlation function is highly enhanced for black holes being near each other. Therefore, you expect that rather than a monochromatic and uniformly distributed uh, distribution, which has been used uh, for, I would say, 40 years for inducing constraints, putting constraints on primordial holes, it's obsolete. We can forget about it. They're ruled out. We do not have any monochromatic spectrum, maybe a 10 to the minus 10 solar masses, but certainly not in the interesting range of a few solar masses to hundreds of solar masses. On the contrary, in that range, the broad range of uh, masses for black holes and clusters of PDH is a rule. So how does, does it come about? So we uh, realized that in last year, mid of last year, that it is possible, mm, uh, following some uh, previous work of, of Chris and others, that not only should we uh, care about what is the radiation pressure that we have at every instant of time, but we should ask what happens at very specific times. For instance, when the electroweak transition uh, occurred when the C, the W, the Higgs, the top, all of those became non-relativistic. There was a drop in the number of efforts. And this gives a corresponding drop in the radiation pressure, and this gives a peak in the matter distribution. The highest drop comes around the QCD era, which was has been explained before. This happens around the proton, uh, anti-proton uh, formation and, and protons and neutrons. But there's another one corresponding to the moment where pines become non relativistic And this gives you this double peak around a few solar masses. And I will show how this is important for gravitational wave uh, events in LIGO. And finally, there is a peak corresponding to the moment where E plus E minus annihilation produces, a, again, a drop in the radiation pressure and a possibly a bump in the matter distribution of black holes at 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. So <clears throat> I would very briefly go here because I don't have time, unfortunately, how the, the connection between the matter uh, formation at the QCD and uh, the, the abundance of black holes. Just let me summarize very briefly. There are primordial supernova at the time of collapse. There is a shock wave. That shock wave hits the plasma immediately surrounding the black holes, and this allows for over the baryon spiral transitions that produce at the QCD scale, they produce the sufficient baryon asymmetry to generate all the baryons in the universe. And we can connect then the dark matter abundance in primordial black holes and the uh, abundance in baryons. So that means that we are opening up a window from a microsecond to three minutes in, within which we can uh, have baryogenesis. But this would require a talk of another 30 minutes. <coughs> This scenario is enough to explain many of the uh, cosmic conundra which are uh, lurking in cosmology 
And uh, we initiated in, in, in 2017, a first uh, description of such a, which we call the seven hints, which suggested that perhaps primordial black holes of this kind are precisely the ones needed to explain the, uh, the observations. Uh, in a later uh, analysis, together with Bernard Carr and uh, Florian Cunel, we address this in, in uh, more depth. And these have to do with planetary mass uh, microlensing, similar to what uh, we've heard from uh, the Subaru telescope, quasar microlensing, the Ogle Gaia microlensing that I will talk in a minute, the cosmic infrared background to X-ray, and the faint dwarf galaxies, etc. But I will concentrate mostly on the uh, LBC uh, black holes. But for this, we have to understand how are they generated. And they're not generated just simply at random when two of them are near each other and somehow they lose energy because of, of an interaction with the third one and therefore they become bound. If you have very dense clusters, those clusters when they form, so they start uh, in creating clusters because of these non-Gaussian fluctuations before recombination. During radiation, they don't change much. The moment they start in, in the matter era, they start uh, forming these clusters. And soon that, those interactions, where there are no longer any photons to displace the barriers, those interactions will create motions of, of those black holes. They will slingshot many of these black holes around. And I can show you here some of the uh, simulations that we, we did for uh, addressing the issue. How many disruptions of binaries can we see? And I was... Let me see whether I can I can run this. I was hoping we would be able to see this. Okay, okay. These are the circles correspond to binaries uh, in in motion. You would have seen uh, these binaries forming and and disrupting. So they are like an stochastic uh, flow. You produce binaries, but they those binaries uh, break up. Some of those binaries are being slick shot away. This is what this red line would correspond to. We would have seen the, 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 um, the movie. You would see how a binary is being thrown out of the, of the cluster. And in, uh, in particular, this is the picture that we observe. Many of the uh, lower mass black holes are slick shot away from the cluster. So there's a segregation of mass. The most heavy ones are in the center of the cluster. The lighter ones are distributed more or less uniformly in the halo. And there are pairs which were bounded inside the higher probability of being bound, which are then slinked shot away. The whole center of mass leaves the black hole. And those are the ones that will uh, collapse to uh, merge to form the, the LIGO events. Now you could follow in time. This is a simulation that lasted the age of the universe. You could follow in time how the depletion of those um, black hole clusters occur as a function of time. And we see there's a fraction of 10 to 20% of those black holes which are uh, leave the, the cluster, they evaporate, those clusters evaporate, and we see that the distribution of masses and mass ratios are such that they could explain the events that we observe in, in LIGO. And this is the kind of analysis that one has to do together with that of SPIN to address the issue of whether these black holes are indeed or not the ones that uh, are seen by LIGO. Now LIGO, we've seen already this image, has seen at least 49 uh, black hole events. Out of those, there are clearly some that are in the astrophysical black hole mass gaps between two and five solar masses, between 50 and 120 solar masses, all of those should not be there. Unless they would come from earlier mergers and they would have a certain property uh, on their spins. Those spins are not, do not show. And we observe nevertheless uh, black holes with a uh, very large masses where they should not be. In the case of uh, the lower mass, we don't know the origin, the higher one is from a uh, very stability supernova. Evolution. Now, the most interesting of all those ranges is the mass below the Chandrasekhar mass, in 1.4 solar masses, because if we observe anything like this, it could only have been primordial, that has been stressed several times. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, a, from microlensing, we already have some evidence, it hasn't been uh, mentioned yet in, in this workshop, from Ogle and Gaia, that there are events in that range, not only a, of a several solar masses, but also below a solar mass. And the way you break the degeneracy between distance and mass is because you observe parallax. It was briefly mentioned in the previous talk. So if the event lasts long enough, in this case, four years, you could see the motion of the Earth around the sun in the uh, modification on the Pachinsky curve of the amplification of light through, through microlensing. And this allows you to break the degeneracy with, uh, with mass, and therefore you can determine what the mass is. And this is the distribution of masses that uh, Ilya Mandel and Lukas Verschikowski obtained last year. And you see that even below solar masses, there are events. 
Now, if you put all of this together, GWTC1, GWTC2, and the OGL results, you see that they cover essentially the mass range that the, the model of the QCD, so proton, proton, and a pion a annihilation would produce in the early universe. So somehow we are seeing within the caveats of the sensitivity of the detector, the fact that we don't observe so easily high, uh, low mass black holes than large mass black holes, this is perfectly consistent with the, it, all of them being uh, primordial. So <clears throat> that's just mass. Let me discuss also the rate of merger events. If we only consider the first GWTC1, so the first run one and two, you see that those events are more or less consistent with the sensitivity of the detector with our prediction of one peak at round two and a peak at round 30 or 50. Now with the full GWTC2, the rate of events precisely coincide. There are a few events we've already been uh, analyzed at a small masses. So uh, typical order one mass ratios, but masses of order one or two. So they are consistent with what we would expect. There are a bunch, really a lot of black holes in the proper mass range at high masses and a few which correspond to a small mass ratios. We still do not have the sensitivity to go down to see this third island. However, there are hints from spin. Let me go very briefly. This analysis was done with the GWTC1 and the first few uh, objects in, in so that were published before GWTC2. Yeah. Yeah. And the prediction that the, the spin of the black hole being zero has on the projected spin on the angular momentum, this chi effective parameter, as well as the final spin of the merged black hole out of the two uh, components, uh, they all agree with the fact that they could have been uh, spin zero. And this is just, maybe it's a coincidence, but this is a hint that those black holes could have been formed with zero spin or tiny spin. Now, we analyzed this in detail. We did a Bayesian analysis. If you put all of GD, G, GWTC2 uh, events together, again, you find uh, the correlation which is consistent with low masses, but it's worth doing a Bayesi analysis. This is what we did very recently, uh, complementing what was done previously by uh, Chris and, and collaborators. So we analyzed what is the effect of spin. And we noticed that doing this comparison between perfectly isotropic or uh, aligned spins versus uh, anti-aligned, mm -hmm. the different uh, hypotheses suggest that we are dominated by low spins in this region. So we can do the uh, spin magnitude posteriors doing what's called hierarchical bias analysis. And we see that within 90% confidence level for isotropic spins, the spins of those black holes in GWTC1 plus the four events oh, in Brunner 3 are can small. Now, <coughs> the future is bright. I'm, I'm finishing now. So even though we have hints, we don't have any evidence yet that these black holes that are observed by LIGO are indeed primordial. These hints will grow in time. However, the definitive proof is when those black holes are observed at redshift 10 from 20 to 100. And for this, we need much better sensitivity than LIGO variable. For this, we need at least the Einstein telescope. The Einstein telescope, and later on LISA, will have enough sensitivity to probe in the 10 to 100 solar masses all the way to redshift 100. With LISA, you can go all the way to recombination. So we could observe yeah. Here, they, they plot cats at uh, one solar mass. Obviously, it's sensitive below solar mass. So we should be able to detect also the low mass uh, black holes at near distances and the high mass black holes at redshift bigger than 10 when there were no stars or 20 when no stars. So I think the future is bright. Let me conclude here. Quantum diffusion is inevitable and it inevitably generates primordial black holes on small scales. The thermal history predicts that the distribution of masses is multimodal. There should be a range of masses. There's a question whether this event seen by the Subaru Hyper Supreme Camp could also be primordial. This would open a new window beyond say 100 TV. So perhaps uh, exploring new physics beyond the standard model. That has a big question mark. The others are perfectly consistent with all we know about the standard model of particle physics and the evolution of the universe. The predicted primordial black hole spin and mass distribution has been measured already around, so in this range between one to a hundred, there are some features we have to be convinced still that these uh, comprise all of the dark matter. Maybe there are a few primordial holes uh, in, in, that, uh, in that range and uh, possibly they could be all of the dark matter if they come from these clusters. 
Other things have to be explored with microlensing, possibly not. Uh, we don't have yet the, the detector for looking at those. We need a megahertz detector. And the PVH scenario can explain the various cosmic conundrum. This, as I described, it created a completely new uh, uh, paradigm shift in the formation of, of structure in the universe. Structures start from small upwards, the uh, merger tree scenario, the way you start with small structures and grow. But the small structures do not come from particles, but they actually come from clusters of platforms. These are the building blocks of the whole structure. So by looking at small scale structures in our galaxy and beyond with lensing and with other uh, features, we should be able to constrain that small scale structure. And I finish here. There's very uh, rich phenomenology and there's a very bright future with multi-scale, multi epoch and multi probe analysis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Garcia Valido, for this wonderful talk. Uh, we have two questions in the chat box. Um, the first question is by uh, Chris Vance. Chris, can you unmute and ask the question directly? And the second question is by Professor Ryoto. Uh, sure. Hi, Juan. Thanks hi, for the talk. Hi, Chris. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it's a question about when you give the, the mass function from the thermal history, very broad. Do you assume Gaussian or non-Gaussian? That's a very good question. OK, um, for that figure, we assume Gaussian. We are exploring at the moment how the non-Gaussian tails uh, affect this. The main feature that the non-Gaussian produces is that in order to uh, have a probability of collapse, which is not negligible, mm -hmm. typically you ask your power spectrum to be very large. You described this very nicely in your talk. Yeah. So for this, of course, it requires a very large amplitude of, uh, of the power spectrum, which already in, in, in implies that there are other constraints, say from PTA and others, which could constrain this. However, for the collapse of, of black holes, the only thing you need is a curvature fluctuation to be above a certain threshold. And this could be obtained in, in rare regions of the universe from the tails of the distribution. So if you have a non-Gaussian uh, fluctuation, your P of K could be 10 to the minus five, and still your tail would be enough to produce the right amount of black holes that we observe to generate such a mass distribution. Um, I agree, although that will have to be huge non-Gaussianity. It, it is a huge non-Gaussianity, indeed. It will really, really huge. And I, I remember your, your work. You cannot do perturbative expansion with an FNN, right. as you described. You need a full non-Gaussian analysis, and the full non-Gaussian analysis suggests that, indeed, the power spectrum can be very tiny and still have a large probability of collapse. In fact, you, you may produce too many. I look forward to the details. Thanks. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice question. Uh, next Tony. Question is by yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Juan. Nice uh, talk. Hi. Hi, Tony. Nice to see you. Um, so I have a question about the clustering. Uh, if I understand yeah. correctly, uh, your uh, numerical simulations is only for one cluster, right? With a large number of uh, uh, PDHs to start from. No, we, we have thousands. We, no, let, let me start. Uh, let me close. Uh, we have thousands of simulations uh, with many different masses, distances, densities. Uh, the one we described in that uh, uh, paper, the, the one that we sent to the archive, indeed, is, is the first of a series of papers in which we, we have analyzed like several thousands of simulations for that particular realization. And we have also a realization for different masses and different, for instance, different distributions around different yeah, positions. What are, what are, my question is about the cosmological evolution, because of course, when you do the things properly and you follow cosmologically the PBH along the whole uh, periods, right? Yes, yes I mean, yes, at, we the do beginning, that. at least if I, if I look at the paper by Yassin, for instance, the one mm -hmm. that uh, we all know. Um, I mean, at a very high ratio, of course, if I use projector, the number of uh, PBH in a cluster is very small, but you start at the same ratio with, with, uh, with number of PBH is incredibly much larger than... Yeah, than it's very small, uh, Tony, it's very small if you assume Gaussian statistics, so the usual uh, excursion set formalism where you assume that every time you make a jump above a threshold, you uh, associate a probability, which is Gaussian distributed, the usual projector for this. Now, in the case of non-Gaussian fluctuation, that's no longer true. So there are you a few regions where you have larger, larger amplitude of fluctuations. Right. And yeah. therefore, there's a much higher probability if you compute the correlation function. You, you did this work with uh, uh, Dejac, no, with Vincent. So if you compute the, the correlation function, what's the probability that you have another black hole at a distance? That is not dominated by the power spectrum, but actually by the high tail of the distribution. And this makes it much more probable that those are together. So, so the initial assumption, 
of a, of Jacin is modified in this situation. Okay, so you're saying that your simulation only holds if you have a, a, non a large non Gaussian yes. scale to increase the, the class. Absolutely okay. true. Right. In general, the whole picture would only hold if it's highly non Gaussian. And I insist this is inevitable. Quantum diffusion. There is also, there is also something else which is uh, worrying me a little bit. The fact that mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you do the cosmological evolution, you have the phenomenon of assembly bias, right? I mean, you have yeah. hierarchical clustering. So it, one has to, to compare two time scales: the time scale for forming, uh, I mean, for merging an halo inside another halo, and the time of uh, you know disruption of the binaries, which are a cylindrical shot, uh, as you said, right? And usually, this time scale uh, they are comparable, or in fact, the binaries which are which are disrupted and primarily because which are ejected are included uh, within the halo, which is including the smaller ones. Yes, so that is true. something that, uh, that uh, your simulation is not able to... to no, no, we, that's exactly what we do. So we put a, a whole distribution of masses inside this halo, which has 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses in total. And mm -hmm. the larger black holes, they're more massive. We find very quickly through dynamical friction, they go to the center. We observe that the least massive, after a very short period, uh, in fact, it, it's less than a billion years, it's a few hundred uh, thousands of years, the, it puffs up. And soon it starts evaporating the light black holes. They are slingshot away by the most massive and most rapidly moving. Now, then you, you have a cluster, the initial, the core of the cluster, which still remains, the massive, the most massive is still there. And you have a very high probability of binding a black holes there of intermediate masses. It's interesting because we would have expected to have very large mass ratios, but we don't find such a large mass ratio. And we find that they, these that have a similar mass then uh, are bounded together. And if they encounter another black hole, they're thrown out. And we evaluated what was the rate of those uh, slingshots uh, bringing out the number of, uh, so the binaries out of those clusters. And surprisingly, it gives the right rate of events for, for LIGO. So the whole simulation lasted the whole uh, age of the universe. So we, we split that into subsets of uh, time scales, high resolution at the initial times, uh, the proper resolution, the corresponding resolution at higher and higher uh, scales. And we could follow what was the evolution of the, uh, of the evaporation of those uh, clusters yeah, and how, what the yeah. probability of those black holes in binaries to, to leave the right. cluster. I think my point was different, but in any case, we can talk later privately. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have one more question by Professor sure. Pijusmani Vattacharji. Uh, Professor Vattacharji, you can unmute yourself and ask. Hiraj, you okay. might maybe I can, I can, yeah, I can read the question. Uh, isn't there additional clustering of the primordial black holes in the galactic halos? So, well, those, yeah, it's a very good question. Those uh, black hole clusters are precisely the building blocks of our halo. Now, typically, the, the uh, embodied simulations that uh, describe the rotation curves of galaxies in, in our halo or in other galaxies' halos have a mass resolution of 10 to the 6, the best, right? when you include also the baryons, some feedback, etc. They have never reached the level of 10 to the 3 solar masses. Now, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, or even 10 to the 5 solar masses could be the size of those uh, initial clusters. They will lose some mass through evaporation. They lose mostly the, the tiny uh, solar mass uh, black holes, hmm, which could give rise to some of the lensing that has been observed, but they comprise a, a small fraction of all of the uh, dark matter in the halo. But otherwise, the distribution of masses in the halo in terms of these uh, clusters of black holes is perfectly consistent with what we observe about the halo of our galaxy. In particular, in the dwarf spheroidals, so in smaller scales, if we uh, realize how the black holes Com, uh, behave together with stars in those uh, dwarf spheroidals, what they will do mostly is link shot stars away. So they're playing um, golf with stars. So stars will be depleted from these uh, places. They will induce a larger mass to light ratio as we observe. And moreover, it will induce hyper velocity stars that has been observed by Gaia that could come from uh, dwarf spheroidals. We did uh, some work with uh, Francesco Montanari that I didn't have time to survey, which showed that at least three of those hypervelocity stars from Gaia actually uh, came from Sagittarius, a uh, dwarf asteroid. So perhaps those, uh, that is the way in which uh, those uh, stars are being uh, depleted from dwarf asteroids and still uh, agree with the observations of uh, primordial propulsion as dark matter. Uh, 
Thanks, Professor Belido. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Professor Belido again.